Good morning, everybody. Bill Lester here with University of Florida IFAS Extension in Hernando County. And sitting right next to me today is my regular co-host, Lily Browning, who is our Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. And Lily had to drop some stuff off at the office today. I figure you just come over and do this in person. That's right. And you gave me the little itty bitty chair again. So that's why I'm not down here. Well, <laughs> it's a proper chair. It's not there. like a cinder block or anything. You I think could, I could stay on my knees the entire hour? I, I'm going to find you a bucket to sit on. And, you know, phone book. A phone book. Yeah, we, I have to keep phone books in here, I guess, to put on the chairs. <laughs> Your chair is higher up than mine. You've got the office chair. <laughs> yeah, not the most comfortable thing if I spend enough hours sitting in this. Morning, I start to feel buddy. it. You lost him. There he is. Good morning, buddy. How are you? <laughs> See, this This is how you click on people's comments and get them to show here and I've everything. Done it. I've okay. Done it. I remember. Yeah, there are times when you're not here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, StreamYard, this, this platform is so easy and so much fun to use. Every time I do this on Thursdays, I think I need to use StreamYard a lot more often. Mm -hmm. So good morning, Cindy. Cindy is from Pinellas County. Hope you had a nice holiday vacation. I did because we were at the beach. <laughs> and then I was off of work for a couple more days. And then off of work for the 4th of July. It was really nice, but it was really tough coming back also. Oh, yeah, it was. I was only gone for a few. You were gone longer than me. Mm -hmm. And I just, oh, there's Monique. Um, I just um, did a real quick visit took my grandson who had stayed here about a month up to um, my son's house in Hampton, Virginia, and spent some time with his little children who are four and six. And I took the two of them to Norfolk Botanical Garden. So making a mental note that go back without them sometime so we can <laughs> look at the botanical garden. I took them to a splash park and part of the children's garden and it was good we did have a lot of good learning things they were both asking me names of plants in virginia and <laughs> which you're probably not that familiar actually, with actually but... they were common enough plants that i did know you know and you know what else they had signs <laughs> <laughs> that helps <laughs> and we moved a worm off of the sidewalk in the sun into the um soil well, that was so nice. That's an important, important lesson yeah. learned. Mm -hmm. It was a great time. It really, really was. Um, it is right next to uh, the Norfolk Airport. I mean, next to mm -hmm. Norfolk Airport. The Botanical Gardens were there first. Airport took some of their land, however, many years ago, and then they got themselves protected, so that can't happen anymore. And if you yeah. happen to be in that area, it's a very nice, very nice um, botanical garden. It's a nice, I'm sure it's a nice time of year up there for a botanical garden because everything's growing and right. flowering. Yes. Mm -hmm. Getting hot up there. It does get hot up north. Mm -hmm. I remember growing up in Maryland. It got hot in the summers. Yes. But not quite as hot as it does here. And yes, Monique, that's why you couldn't get on last week because <laughs> we didn't do this last week. Yeah, Every once gone. in a while. We were, were both gone. He was at the beach. I could have been at the, I could have gone over to Virginia Beach, but I was only um, there for a couple well, of days. We had internet in the RV at the beach. <laughs> I guess I could have could have popped on, but there's but, this thing when your salary, you know, if you show up for like a minute, then you work for the day, and then that's an issue when you're on vacation. They don't care with me. <laughs> <laughs> so. so. So if you guys have any lawn and garden questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments and we'll do our very best to answer them. Let's see. Um, today, shortly after we finish with the clinic here this morning, we're going to be back on Facebook since Lily is here visiting at the office doing Facebook Live. And we're going to have a little taste test because this past weekend I was at the store and found yellow dragon fruit and we just recently had a class on yellow dragon fruit where the participants got three plants to take home and plant and you rarely see yellow dragon fruit at the stores you see the um dragon fruit that has a red mm -hmm. skin 
and the white inside with the really, really, really tiny seeds like the size of a kiwi fruit seed. But yellow dragon fruits, just a little bit different. And we're going to have a little taste test on Facebook Live. So if you guys are free, see, we're going to try to wrap up here at about 1045. I would think by 11 or 5 of 11, we'll have everything set up and we'll be back on Facebook Live snacking on dragon fruit. And uh, everybody get, have you ever tried dragon yeah. fruit? You haven't? No, no, I haven't. Oh, okay. So we have. <laughs> so I know that Lily's never tried it. I wonder if Bernie's ever tried it. Does it taste like dragon? Doesn't. Uh, well, what does dragon taste like? I don't know. Just like chicken. No, it does not taste like chicken. I can tell <laughs> I you that much. It tastes like lizard or of some sort. Doesn't right? taste like lizard. <laughs> no, dragons would. Dragons probably would. Yeah, but dragon fruit. It's. I like it. Is it a, it's, it's something you can, a crop you can grow in the summer here, correct? Yes. They grow it commercially down in South Florida. So um, I believe Lee is on here today. Lee could grow them in her yard. And if you live in Miami, Homestead, down in the Keys, you, they grow just great down there. And they grow them commercially. And it is a cactus. And the cactus flowers at night, I believe, and turns into a big fruit. We're going to see that when we do the Facebook Live. You know, I checked the package this morning. Do you know where these dragon fruit came from? I do not. Because I was thinking, well, I wonder if they picked them in South Florida. They're starting to harvest them now. So you can find dragon fruit at the stores. Ecuador. Oh, all right. So we got imported dragon fruit. Sorry. I mean, we try to, you know, support Florida growers, but these are from Ecuador. So, but yeah, they grow just great in South Florida. Uh, here in Central Florida, <clears throat> they'll grow very well also, but you have to protect them from freezing in the winter. And that's where it gets a little tricky. I'm going to go over for those who participated Tuesday in the ginger and turmeric class that you had. I talked to you afterwards because that's the one of the reasons I'm here, too, is <laughs> to give my plants. But I did have <laughs> um, uh, actual work reasons, too. but. I had noticed that the um, uh, grad student that you had speaking um, said she was great. She was, she was very impressive. She was um, that it should grow eight to ten months before harvest. And I was figuring out when we're getting these plants, they don't have eight to ten months before winter, and they're going to send us down. You're counting. <laughs> yeah, if they start growing in March. By right. November, that's eight months. Okay, but we're getting them in June. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're going to start going down for the winter, especially here in Central Florida. So the question I asked you is, do we stop the clock there and then wait a few months? And you said no. When they start coming up again in the spring, you start counting eight to ten months at that point. So we're just going to have – we're going to grow them at this point just to kind of – get them started and then once they start up again in the spring then you start counting your eight months to harvest them is that correct yeah that sounds good <laughs> and the other thing i noticed that she because there was a question of can you just harvest some and she said what would happen when you do that is your because the tubers grow so intertwined and everything with each other that you will probably all you will do, you won't save the other parts. You'll, you, you will have damaged them. So it's best just mm -hmm. to get it all out at once. What I would do with mine is take them home. This is what, July 7th. <clears throat> take them home, plant them in a good spot. Partly sunny. I have a spot um, underneath some palm trees. So it gets some sun, kind of speckled sun. Fairly shady, so not a whole lot of direct sun. I'm going to let them grow. And this winter, they're going to die back. And um, most of the foliage is going to turn brown and maybe just completely disappear. In the spring, they're going to come up again and be established. And then next summer, they're going to get even bigger in a clump. And probably next November is when I would dig the whole clump up and take what I want and save some of the roots and probably clip off all the um, foliage and then replant those roots and just leave them. 
because so if the roots are healthy about... and doing okay in the soil, when the time is right in the spring, they'll come up and grow. They'll send up new shoots and new. You're talking about harvesting in November of 2023. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Now you could put them in the ground now and do that this coming November, but you're probably not going to have a whole lot of roots to pick from. Right. You might, if you're, if you really pour on the, 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 the love and attention and the good care and get them to grow really well, you might, it might be worth doing it this November. Yeah, she yeah. mentioned that eight months though. I'll have to see how mine look. Yeah. Because these plants come from tissue culture, not existing tubers. Mm -hmm. So it takes a while for them to grow big enough and old enough to make their own tubers. But now after that, every year you dig them up, take what you want, take some of the tubers and just put them back in the ground and they'll come back and take care of themselves. You know, you can do the same thing with sweet potatoes. Yes. Grow them in a patch, harvest 99% of them, leave a few scattered around, and forget about them. Next spring, they're going to come back up on their own. And by the next fall, a year later, you have a whole other crop. They kind of, they replant and regenerate and re-go on their own. While I was away, I was only away about four days, but I um, mentally stayed in Florida by reading South Moon Under by Marjorie Keenan Rawlings, who wrote The Yearling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she had, she lived kind of near Micanopy. Um, you can go see where the Cross Creek, you know, where she resided. But it was very, very interesting. It was, you know, about Florida out in basically, from what I figured, the Ocala, what is now the Ocala National Forest. The people living out in the scrub compared to the people who lived in the hammock. And there's just so many um, old ways we have forgotten, you know, how they survived. And sweet potatoes was definitely one of them. They talked about that a lot, mm -hmm. that, you know, how are you going to get by this year? Well, I've got my slip of sweet potatoes, you know, you know, in the field. And the other thing that they would do is um, uh, trap the wild hogs and pen them up for a while and fatten them up on good food. And then, you know, they would... Of course, they made parties out of rendering hogs and everything, but you just so many. I uh, know they ate swamp cabbage and all that stuff, too. It's very interesting to read any of her books if you really want to get a feel for old Florida. And when I say old Florida, this took place, I would say, um, you know, between 1890 and maybe 1910, because there were cars, you know, <laughs> but yeah. it's just the, the yeah, the just a, just a hundred years ago, yeah, just the transitional period and how. They even talked about how a lot of the land was taken for a national forest and a lot of it was being uh, timbered and all kinds of stuff. It was just really, really cool. You're sounding like Bernie again. <laughs> 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 I can bring Bernie in here. He's here. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to uh, drag Bernie in with the dragon fruit taste testing a little bit later on. Monique, you don't even want to know the conversations <laughs> Bernie and I have. I stopped by specifically this morning to talk to Bernie and I said I had a very serious question for him and the question was why would someone have a mental breakdown over leaving a cake out in the rain and what happened to the recipe these are the kind of conversations Bernie and I had those, those important topics yeah. Well, we have a couple questions on here about very, very important topics. Let's go up and get started on the beginning one here. Monique has a Louis Philippe rose. Felipe. Those kind of roses, roses don't do really, really well in Central Florida because they have so many different disease and insect problems. They're very Especially, high maintenance. Oh, summertime. Um, we could get actually the family and consumer science agent here. <laughs> He's here today. Scott, years ago, um, used to be a Rosarian. I think he's given up on it since he moved to. Yeah, I don't know if he, he did it at his last house. He had a lot of roses. Yes. And, and this, I'll, I'll repeat what I've said about these roses before. I have uh, the old, you know, what they call back to that. Marjorie Keenan Rawlings, you know, cracker roses, you know, um, just kind of rambling roses. Does fine. I ignore it. It's just little white roses on a vine, you know. 
Um, but if you are, and there are native swamp roses. <laughs> um, there are native swamp roses that are pink roses that grow here native. If you are looking at your Louis Philippe or your Mr. Lincoln's or your William Lester's, whatever they <laughs> name mm -hmm. these roses, these hybrid teas, you can grow them here. But you are going, to, it's going to be a daily project. You have to be so in love with your roses. It has to be what you get up for in the morning. And you have to be, and you know, that's fine if that's what you want to do. And you de-stress by taking care of these roses and creating this beauty. But especially, especially, especially in the hot, humid summers, they're going to attract every fungus that you can think of. You will have to be putting fungicide on them weekly. Yeah, yeah, well. And, you know, for no, it, it, it depends on the variety. Some are going to be a little more um, disease resistant than others. But tea ro those types of tea roses here in Central Florida will need a fungicide in the summer and an insecticide part of the year. They get really bad problems with thrips, a number of other things. They get a lot of different fungal diseases. And that is, she says that she's cast that rose and it's got a stem that's turning black with drooping leaves. Is it a stem canker? My guess is yes, because it will get leaf spots. It will get stem canker. Stem canker is like a stem spot. It's a rotten spot on the stem, mm -hmm. and it will go all the way through, and then everything above that point on the stem is going to turn black, die, the leaves drop off, falls over. But the good thing about roses, if you catch it in time, you can actually cut it down beyond that point and let it start again. Yeah, a lot of people will prune it back really hard january or so but no i'm yeah. thinking more in the fall because they can do okay during the winter here right okay it's yeah. this time of year during the summer with the heat humidity and if we start to get that magical amount of rain a couple rains a week especially late in the day your rose is sitting there all night long soaking wet from the rain 100 mm -hmm. humidity temperatures in the 80s potentially perfect for fungus bad for roses so you can grow them. It's just going to be uh, a good amount of work, and you're really going to have to uh, start applying a fungicide on some kind of regular basis. And she says that she's never used a fungicide. So, you need to look into fungicides. Yes. Um, there's a number of them that you could pick from that are that have roses on the label that you can use. Uh, big box store, Lowe's, Home Depot, Lawn and Garden Center is going to have a lot to pay you from. go down or go anywhere where they have beautiful rose gardens here in Florida. I know they, at least they used to down by the Ringling Museum in Sarasota. Several other places have beautiful, beautiful rose gardens. I promise you a ton of money and a ton of chemicals goes on those roses <laughs> to make that happen. They, they just take more effort here than they would up oh, north. So if you do. grew them up north, it's going to be different growing them down here. And it's because of the humidity. Yeah, and some are just not very, some varieties are not going to be very tolerant of diseases, and they're going to die pretty quickly, and they're going to totally die. And there are Rosarian societies. I mean, you can get in touch with them. I know a lot there. I know several people in Brook, the Brooksville area, um, Monique. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, like, live in the country club area or other places. They they live for their roses. They love to, you know, that's how they de-stress. You know, that's their hobby. So those are the people. Some of them might be associated with some garden clubs. So, you know, find them and ask them what they do and what works for them. But as far as Florida friendly, when we just talked about all that maintenance, <laughs> I'm sorry, that doesn't fall under the Florida friendly um, uh, banner. So we have a question you or comment from Cindy, and I knew that I know that we have people from Pinellas County who listen on a regular basis, and I knew this was going to come up. So let's go ahead and cover it right now. Uh, Cindy says, and I know that Cindy is in Pinellas County. Cindy says the Oriental fruit fly has been found in Pinellas County in Saint Petersburg. The county is very concerned about this. 
The state of Florida is very concerned about that also. Florida Department of Agriculture is very concerned about that. So just recently, we've had two different nasty things discovered here in Florida, which is unusual to have them back to back. They found oriental fruit flies in Pinellas County in St. Petersburg. They found them in traps. Giant snail. And they found the giant African land snail in Pasco County, which is going to be a big deal because that is a really, really bad invasive pest also. Just think, though, about those two names. Oriental fruit fly, giant African land snail. They are telling you in their name that they are from other places. Yes, they're both invasive. Now, the oriental fruit fly, have no idea how it got here. The, Probably in Afri the nursery trade. African land snail, it got here from the pet trade. Somebody had one or a couple as a pet, didn't want them anymore, and threw them in the backyard. Mm -hmm. And now there's a bunch of them. And state of Florida is going to have to come up with a plan and implement the plan to eradicate them. And eradicating an invasive anything is very, very difficult to do. Oriental fruit flies have been found in Florida a number of times before, and they're going to do their very best to eradicate them also. We will have classes on both geared towards homeowners to explain just what the heck a fruit fly and a snail is, if you don't already know, why these fruit flies and snails are really bad, what are the bad things they can do, and how you can identify them. And if you have one and you're like, is this one? Is it not? Because, you know, there's a lot of snails out there. We have a lot of native snails. There's yeah, all kinds of right. snails. But these snails are, you make a fist, uh -huh. they're even bigger than mine. Yeah, we're, we're going to teach you yeah. the basics of how to tell if it's a oriental fruit fly or a giant African land snail or if it's maybe just a house fly and a regular backyard native snail. And if you're if you're not sure we'll teach you all about taking pictures and who to send them to so that we can identify them and tell you hey it's okay or oh no we have some bad news for you because both of these are potentially huge terrible pests that are going to have a huge economic impact environmental impact and like i said they're still in the process of figuring out exactly where we are with this and we will have classes coming up that of course we will share with you. We're gonna do most likely on through Facebook Live and we'll record them, we'll make you them available you here, there, to have and everywhere. The nursery inspector um, come on, didn't you? For a class. Yes. And I'm sure he's involved, probably helping with both of these. Mm -hmm. But we... our district nursery inspector or you know, our area. He and he he'd be great, a great person to hear from Stephen Jenner. And, yeah. He's a great guy in general. He's great to hear from. Yes. Um, he is our state or our local area plant nursery inspector. Yes. So he is the person who goes, he works for the Florida Department of Agriculture, and he inspects nurseries. And they look for invasive things. And they look for these kind of snails and these kind of fruit flies and other things. So and right now, I mean, the fruit flies will be very hard to for us to see with our own eyes but if we run across a snail we're concerned about what should we do take a picture well first of all capture it don't let it just wander off at least capture it and put it in a bucket or a container and take a number <laughs> of really good pictures and send them to us or your county's extension service or there is a service that is run by university of florida called DDIS, the Distance Diagnostics and Identification Service. I use it all the time. I have an account and I send pictures. <gasps> oh my goodness, look at this. Breaking Florida news. Snail identification sheet. <laughs> See, Florida snail <laughs> sure. identification sheet. Teresa just brought this into us and oh, here's the oh my gosh, one. it's an identification and the sheet. Exotic one. I bet you she could scan this, and if you email Dr. Lester, he could send you a PDF of this 
It came from or Teresa. I'm sure in about one minute we'll share the link in the uh, comments in the chat here. So which one? Number seven. Here's your giant African land snail. <laughs> and there it is. This is the giant African land snail. Boy, that's it big. Is. And what does it say? Inward curl of the shell has light to dark brown shells and vertical stripes. Ooh, vertical stripes. Remember that. That's important. Of a darker shade of brown on them. It says it was eradicated from Florida in 2021. Guess what? People in the pet trade brought them back anyway, even though it was illegal. They were a problem in Miami. They were a problem in the 60s. And Not to sound like Bernie, but they were a problem in the 60s in Miami. They will eat the stucco off your house <laughs> if and if, when they're done eating all your plants. So, <laughs> so like I said, we're going to have a class, and as materials like this come out, we're going to share them with you just as quickly as we can. Well, I think we set like record time there within a minute of it being released, and Teresa seeing it. Well, we have a link here that's for the how public. Teresa is. Yes. <laughs> and. We're going to hopefully give everybody the information they need so that when you're out working in your yard, taking your trash can out to the curb, whatever it might be, you can help and you can be on the lookout for things. And you'll know exactly where to send your questions, your pictures, um, everything else to get it and, identified. And Dr. Lester is working on getting educational information out to you. The media is going to make you panic. The media is going to make you think these these you know snails are going to be knocking on your door like a land shark and <laughs> trying to you know come in and eat your family or something mm -hmm. um you know the media just tends to do that to have news and i'm sure there were people with travel issues over this weekend at airports i was not one of them that's all that the media said was that the airports are terrible la 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 la, la. i went through atlanta they didn't have any issues so you know sometimes just kind of Wait and wait and see, but we'll get you this information as soon as they have it from the uh, FDAPs. So stay, stay tuned. We'll have a lot more information coming for you. And if you happen to see a snail the size of a man's fist, <laughs> try to capture it in a bucket or something yes. and take a picture and um, send it to Dr. Lester. Yes, the adults get very, very large, but of course they start off as small snails. So it really helps to be able to identify them based on their shell, no matter what size they are. And we're gonna to put together, I need to put together training, number one for myself, mm -hmm. number two for everybody in the office and Lily, number three for our master gardeners, and number four for the public. So we're gonna, that gives me something to be creative with and work on, I guess. And you know, while we're looking out for these, giant African land snails, the tegu lizards are going to sneak up on us. So I wonder if the tegu lizards eat, eat the snails. snails. I wondered that too. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to have to ask. But in the that. meantime, as I say, everyone has their friend in Newport Ritchie. Everyone I know has a friend in Newport Ritchie, a brother in Newport Ritchie, a sister, a niece, somebody in Newport Ritchie. For the time being, you know, we don't know all the official rules yet, so we can't really say anything. So just two homeowners it's a good idea not to be trading plants right now with your friends in Newport Ritchie. Because even if you don't see the giant snail, there could be eggs or something on it. So Yeah, they will have a um uh quarantine area where you're not allowed to bring plants in or out or um yard waste in or out. And and they're gonna have a press conference today and the state of Florida is gonna come out with all the details. But Basem asks, can we grow cardamom in Central Florida? I believe we can. I think we looked that up just recently, yeah, didn't we? we? Yeah. That. yeah. Yeah, and you know, growing any kind of herbs and spices like that is great, even if you're just experimenting with it, because they're so expensive at the store. If you can grow your own here, that is just a huge bonus. So what should they do if they did not sign up for the ginger and is it turmeric or turmeric or does it matter? Either. Okay. Either is. I like turmeric. I, um, I say turmeric. Yeah. If they didn't sign up for the class and aren't getting plants from you, but they still want to have the knowledge. 
We're going to do something on Facebook Live about that. Do you want to do that on Monday? It's coming Monday because I mentioned to Teresa we could do that. We'll still have some plans sitting here for okay. visual aids. Okay. Yeah, if you missed our class on growing ginger, edible ginger, and turmeric, we'll do it on Facebook Live this coming Monday. And I sent the class, the recording off to John yesterday, and okay. he should have it done for me today. He said he'd have it done for me today because I get really, really fast results from John. Well, you know not what? sure how long it takes for you, but he gets mine back in Do a day. you know why he can get yours back so quickly this week? Why is because that? I didn't have a class this week. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I oh. think what he does is he puts yours on hold to no, knock mine out. No, he he. It's just I give him so many. I try. <laughs> I try to. I I try to keep it to once every couple of weeks. Oh, no. So he gets one I, week I, for me. I don't want to wear out my welcome. <laughs> That's why I have eighty one YouTube videos. <laughs> He'll get one next week. I've already finished it. Um, and since we segued into that, next week on Wednesday at ten a.m. If you go to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Fernando FFL Program Facebook page, um, you will see there will be the link for the Zoom class on recycling inside and out. And our friend Carmen Bruno will be there with me. And he, it'd be the first half really will be very specific to Hernando County and our recycling program. Still interesting stuff to learn, even if you're not from it, you know, just about recycling in general. The main reason I wanted to do the class is because I keep seeing comments, and now, and this was what really angers me, people trying to sell a product, a good product, a product of, you know, um, laundry detergent, the, the whole detergent is just like in a dryer sheet kind of thing, you know, saves that extra packaging and stuff. Yeah. That's good. That's not a bad thing, but the way they're advertising it is by saying that recycling is a lie and not happening. And that just, you know, to spread that kind of myth <laughs> just for marketing, when we're all supposed to be on the same page, really aggravates me. So I'm bringing him on to say, you know, that is a myth. Recycling is still happening. Of course, we forget those other two R's, reduce and reuse. And we should concentrate on those. So we're going to cover that, you know, your household recycling. And then I'm going to talk about recycling in the landscape and the different ways that we do that. Rain barrels, compost bins, all, you know, using leaves or pine needles as mulch, all those things. So that's going to be Wednesday at 10. And if you are in Hernando County and, you know, just want to have two classes from me in one day, <laughs> <laughs> that pollinator class that I taught a few weeks ago, I'll be teaching it live at the Spring Hill Library at 2.30. So Wednesday's going to be a busy day for me. That sounds like fun. Okay, we that have a couple like other sarcasm. questions. <laughs> we have a couple other questions here, so let's knock out one or two before we go back to the snails, I guess. <laughs> you got to show my mealy bugs, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll try to knock these out real quick. Johanna says... She has mango trees, and out of the th um, out of the tr three trees, she made a big ring around two of them with old branches, and they almost died this past winter. One of them, the ring was made with aluminum posts left over from a shed, and that tree did better. I know Johanna lives here in Hernando County, and mangoes are tough to grow here because during the winter, they stop growing. They technically... Botanically speaking, don't go dormant. They go quiescent, which means they just sit there and don't grow or do anything. And they can be damaged by the cold. So they're always going to get at least a little bit of damage here unless you have a way to drag them into your house or you're growing them in a greenhouse or something. So with her ring of sticks and stuff, was that cold protection? Is that what she was... Yeah, with mangoes, you're really going to have to cover them on nights when it gets, I would guess, below 40. Because mangoes get really unhappy below 40. It doesn't have to get to 32 for them to get right. to the point where they're damaged. They're tropical fruit, yes. And more and more and more people are trying mangoes here. And, you know, I say go for it, try it, you know, with uh, climate change. <laughs> we can use that... Uh, unfortunate circumstance to experiment with 
more tropical, but the, the word there was experiment because we are going to get free. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Yeah. So mangoes, you can definitely experiment with. You really have to be careful to keep them warm during the winter. And here's another non snail question from David. Uh, David asked, can I fertilize a Robolini palm and Sylvester palm this time of year in Sumter County? Sure. Yes. But you want to go out and purchase and use a quality palm fertilizer because palms are really, really fussy in particular about their micronutrients. They are. So you want to use a good palm fertilizer and not a turf fertilizer or 666. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't, yeah. Don't use turf fertilizer. It, it can palms, kill a palm over a couple palms years. Palms do not like a lot of nitrogen. A lot of nitrogen will kill them. Yeah. But so. the palm fertilizer has the potassium. Magnesium, manganese, boron, all the things that are really important for palms that a lot of other plants really don't care that much about. Turf grass, all turf grass wants is nitrogen. It doesn't really need, it our, doesn't need, nothing else is critical for it. Our rebellinis get fried here every winter. So in Sumter County, it's very possible that that will happen too. I have one that's tucked up right by the front of the house, and some of the outer leaves, I lose them, but the rest is fine. If you have a robolini out right in the middle of your huge front yard and it's a night that gets down into the 20s depending on where you are in Sumter county you i've never really seen them completely killed no, but they will lose all the back. all their leaves all their foliage yeah. my neighbors i that i drive by um theirs is coming back pretty good now but it was frozen to the ground now if he's in the villages or something he might have some a lot of houses around that help provide a microclimate it just depends on your your situation. So. Okay, going back to snails. Cindy says, reports said people used to drink the mucus of the snails. Okay, well, you're going to make me barf now. It's going to be, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they would get the worms they carried. Oh, yes, they would, if they had the worms. So... Let me, let, me, oh, meningitis. let me let me yes. explain this simply because I understand it. And of course, the news is being vague and incorrect about it. Okay. You must be listening to, to NPR or something. And they're saying that the snails are going to give you meningitis. Sir, pretty much all species of snails can carry a nematode parasite that's called, and I don't know what the scientific name is, but this nematode causes a disease called rat lungworm. Really nasty name for a really nasty disease. This nematode cycles between rats and snails. I did read this. Definitely. So it, it, rats can catch it, and it doesn't kill rats. But rats will then poo, and snails come along and eat that. Now the snail picked it up, and then the snails are eaten by the rats, and it will cycle back and forth between rats and snails. So if you're thinking, well, how the heck did this involve me? That's really, really nasty. <laughs> you're correct. That's really nasty. But if people, if you handle snails, you can get the nematodes on your hands, chew your fingernails, eat a sandwich or a hot dog, you can get them. For anybody who is dumb enough to eat a raw snail or, or we're not even going to talk about Cindy's comment, any other part of the snail, you can catch it. If you come in contact with rat feces, you can catch it also if the rat had it and if the snail had it. Not every rat carries this nematode, not every snail carries it. And I am interested to hear, I know that the giant African land snails that they had in Miami were capable of carrying it. I don't know if any of them had the nematode. I'd be interested to see I'm sure they're going to test samples. If you go out there to Newport Ritchie, catch 100 snails, send them all off to the lab, how many of them have this nematode? Is it 100? Is it none? Is it 50? I don't know. It's it's almost like um, armadillos have the potential to transfer leprosy mm -hmm. to humans. But, but you but have to happened, handle them. It's happened. Actually, probably about a dozen times, they said, which surprised me. Mm -hmm. But usually like Louisiana, Alabama, um, and I would assume it's people who are catching them to eat them. Mm. Sure. So so today's advice for Thursday, July 7th is... Don't touch. <laughs> don't play with 
or eat the raw snails. Don't play with or eat the raw just, armadillos. Just say Escar no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make a graphic that says that now. <laughs> and I'm going to get myself in trouble, but I'm probably going to do it anyway. <laughs> I like that. So just Escar no. <laughs> now we're going to get in trouble with the French or something. Yeah. I don't know. So just say well, Escar no. So I don't get in trouble. It, there was a writer from the New York Times who's, who yeah. used that term. So. <laughs> It's not mine. So, <laughs> so if you do have to handle these snails, or, and this advice goes for anybody handling any kind of toad or tree frog, Cuban tree frog, bufo toad, whatever it might be, wear gloves or at least a plastic grocery store bag or two over your hands and wash your hands really okay. well by the time you're done. How about this scenario? Your dog has an interest in the African land snail. The dog sniffs all over it and then brings that the dog touches you i can't say for sure i wash, would think that would be pretty pretty hands. incidental yeah. and you know they do have tracking dogs they've trained to sniff out yeah I think these they snails. Have they'll be yeah they'll yeah. be in newport ritchie they're they're bringing them down to help yeah, find them so right. yeah i think they use beagles for things like that cute little beagles <laughs> Shanna says that she is unfortunately in the Newport Ritchie in the quarantine area and no longer sharing any of her garden with anyone. Good plan for Very now, important. Shannon. And like yes. I said, we will have more classes. We'll have more training. We'll pull together the materials and make them as available to the general public as we possibly can. And there is, if, there's, a, if there's a Home Depot in the quarantine area. Yeah. Uh -oh. It's going to, you know, hit the commercial nurseries big small or whatever pretty hard and maybe they just have to be inspected more often maybe they'll still be able to do some business we don't know right now that's what we're just saying i really can't say we have to wait <laughs> yeah. for um florida department of agriculture to come out with all of the facts and findings and the plans and regulations and everything they're planning on doing and then it's going to be our job to share that with everybody and explain it in terms that you can understand. Sure. But for now, just as I said, if you're a homeowner and you have a friend in Newport Ritchie, you live in Newport Ritchie, keep your plants to yourself. Don't accept plants <laughs> from Newport Ritchie. I think Ritchie. for now, Monique sums it up she does. pretty accurately she does. with yes. you. So. Yes. What does Brenda say there? Oh, Brenda's good. here for a little bit, so that's yeah. great. Yeah, I saw uh, a few minutes ago we had a top number of like twenty-five people on here. That's great. Oh, we're yeah. growing. We need to we need to share the word and get more people. Speaking of sharing, share my mealy bugs. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Let's see if we have any other let me go because I got it right here. Dun, dun, dun. This is at my house. Here, okay. Here, here we, we go. Are, we got the technology figured out. We, yeah, we figured out this band name, Lily Bill and the Mealy Bugs. Um, <laughs> this is on some sage of mine. That happens every year every around this year. time. See, they started. I first noticed them a while ago on prickly pear, and I've I have since read they really love succulents. And, you know, they've destroyed, they've turned some prickly pear into complete mush, but I didn't care. It was prickly pear, you know, it was, you know, it's good for the tortoises and stuff, but there's plenty. Yeah, yeah, not really in more, ornamental. Plenty more in my yard for them in the wild area. But then uh, my beach sunflowers started really going down. And sometimes it does that once, you know, August or so. It doesn't like a lot of rain. But they started going black and dying. And then in that bed, I also have added a whole lot of different types of salvia, of sages. Yep. And I happen to turn those around and I'm like, oh my gosh, look what's going on here. And some of them had quite a bit. We get that every year at our Master Gardener Nursery, uh, just on the salvias. But they all always get it. And it's during the summer. And you know, it's it, that is about the only insect pest problem that they have to deal with out there. Mm -hmm. They don't. So if so you buy plants for a nursery, they're not dripping with pesticides. They're, so what do they do? Um, insecticidal soap. Okay. Well, I was probably more than one application, but mealy bugs are very, very soft body. So insecticidal soap will definitely kill them and be effective. 
you need to spray them. Check back maybe a week later, probably spray again to catch any that you missed. And they're pretty easy to get rid of. Here's what I did since I was going out of town, you know, didn't have, I'm, I'm one of those really lazy people who had to go to the store to <laughs> purchase something. So, and they really seem to be all over that beach sunflower and I can't find any written material about that, but they, you know, you look under, they were all over. So, and getting onto the stages as well. Yeah. So what I did was cut so much of it back. I didn't pull them out of the ground. I cut them back, some of them like to the ground and anything that I saw that had a significant amount of these mealybugs on them. Yeah. Yeah. Sean says yeah. he has them on his Coreopsis okay. also. So they, they, so they, they feed on I, a wide variety of plants. I gave my bed a major trim without taking anything totally out thinking it's summer. They're going to make a comeback. <laughs> and I put all of that stuff in a garbage bag. You know, and I really took the beach sunflower down to where there's hardly anything that you can see right now. There, beach sunflower is going to come back, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, just gave the sages a whole lot of trim because it's only like the one half of my bed, it hasn't made it down to the other half yet. But while I was picking up some of the beach sunflower, there was at least one ladybug I noticed that fell out. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, you're not going in the bag with everything else to be killed. And I put it, picked it up and put it on some of my sages. So my hope was I got rid of the infected material, most of it. Mm -hmm. I know there are beneficials there. There's, so, a, there's a number of different beneficials yeah. that'll prey on mealybugs. So I put that ladybug back, assuming it is one of many, I hope, mm -hmm. as well as wasps and things like that. And then we also had some pretty heavy rains which in one way is helpful because it actually knocks it off the plant in the other way it's like it makes great conditions in the soil for the mealy bugs but yeah so that was my first step and it's looking pretty good but i'll keep an eye on it to see if i have to go to the step of the insecticidal soap yeah and that just comes down to scouting mm -hmm. and being aware of um like Sean says, the Master Gardener Nursery doesn't have them yet. But Sean, I could tell you that you need to keep your eyes open for them because we get them every year. So if you know this is something that comes back, let's say every July, every August or whatever, you know to check. You know that it's nothing to go into a big panic over and just hit it with insecticidal soap a couple times and the problem mm -hmm. is solved. So no, being yeah. aware and of the potential I, problems. I, you know, looked upside down. <laughs> and turn those leaves over i didn't realize how bad of a problem it was you got to check yeah. under those leaves yeah and evelyn says um she has up on her plumeria so it's just, so they it's get on a variety of different conditions plant species. are optimal for mealybugs right now perfect for mealybugs if you're a fungus oh my gosh this is like the best time of year for you because it's warm it's hot during the day it's warm at night it's raining right now. I'm getting rain every afternoon, at least a little bit. It rains late enough in the day so that everything is soaking wet and all the leaves are covered with water all night long. Mm -hmm. And the humidity is 100% all night. And the temperature is not getting below, I guess, mid-70s or so. If you're a fungus, you're in heaven. This is, the, this is why fungi moved to Central Florida is for this kind of weather and they're spreading like crazy so be aware of that they're going to make you know stem cankers on your roses they're going to make little black spots on your leaves there's other things that can make black spots on your leaves we're going to do a class on that soon i'm writing a blog post on the the algal leaf spot the algae mm -hmm. that causes leaf spot problems so and just be aware of that i think that that mealybug white cottony mass is a fungus but you look closely at it like i took that picture yep those are it's a piercing sucking insect yeah and if you sit there and look at them very closely or especially if you throw them under a dissecting microscope or with a hand lens they move around yeah. so i don't know if you can see my cursor or not but this one on the right hand side on the leaf um is an actual mealybug and he's probably crawling around he's moving around 
Well, so, not anymore because he's been smothered in a <laughs> trash bag and is in the landfill now. <laughs> so they, they are visible. You can actually see them moving around and, and doing their thing and doing their mealybug work. They're so insulted. How dare they come and <laughs> assault my garden? Well, like I said, that's normally that is about the only major insect pest problem we get at the nursery. Um, oh, and that's where all those sages came from. <laughs> so yeah, um, but but you know, they just happen to love sage. Yeah, they yeah. do. They love salvias, that, and that is that bed um, used to be all beech or dune sunflower, and the longer the bed exists. And it keeps getting mulched and more organic material. You know, it's a nice, rich area. Ask the Bermuda grass. Mm -hmm. uh, beach yeah. sunflower hates nice, rich areas. So it's been kind of dying. It likes down. the beach, really. Yes. It'll, it'll grow on the sand. And you know where I had ocean. more growing last year? My husband um, enlarged our driveway just by cutting, you know, cutting some lawn out by hand and putting gravel down. That's where the beach sunflower wants to grow. It skipped the lawn and went to where the gravel was. I pulled it out. I'm going to try and transplant it. It hates to be transplanted. It was more or less a Hail Mary, you know. Can you start it from cuttings pretty easily? I would think. It, it's it's got kind of can. a binding habit. So. I bet you can, yeah. yeah. If you snip, clip, dip, stick, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You sh yeah. If you do it, um, propagate them that way. But by pulling them out by the roots and then putting them, I put some in a pot, put some in my wildflower garden. Um, we'll see. I've had limited success by putting it in a pot. But you're right, actually propagating it, I will have to try that sometime. Okay, if anybody has any quick last minute questions, I think we're going to wrap it up and we're going to go taste some yellow dragon fruit. Are you sure we're not tasting this, right? Uh, yeah, you don't want to taste that. If you want this, um, there was a link that Teresa showed you or email Dr. Lester and he can send you a PDF of this. It is called, if you want to Google it, maybe Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Division of Plant Industry might have it. Florida Snail Identification Sheet. Here are the good snails, <laughs> the natives. And here are the exotic. And this is your giant. And <laughs> this is hard to do. I think um, aside from size, these vertical stripes are going to help. And that the fact that it curls inward, you know, is going to help you with ID. But take a picture. Yeah. Send it to Bill. So you don't just like try to throw five pounds of salt on the snail to kill it, do you? No, no, you don't do that. And if you want more information, if you want, you know, a link to this or copies, contact our office. There's the phone number. Uh, Teresa's here today. She'll answer the phone. Teresa does everything. Yeah, she's good that way. We yeah. couldn't we couldn't get by without yeah. Teresa. So we'll have to actually bring her around and let her show herself for us. We second. yeah, we never get her on here alive. Well, she's gonna be on here with she, us next week. Yeah, she doesn't want to talk, but maybe she'll come around. She has a camera. Here. She's got a camera on that computer out there. Yeah, we're <laughs> gonna get her on here live next week. And Sean, you are most welcome. Yes. And Sean is one of your very active mm -hmm. master gardeners. And even though we didn't really um, discuss poo and all, what we did when it came to the yeah. rat longworm, because that is yeah, how it gets yeah. cycled There's between all, rats and snails. We always talk poo. <laughs> yeah, we always have to tie that in. So. <laughs> it's the stuff of life, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you say so. Okay, well, don't want to do that. Okay. I don't see any other comments or questions on here. So, hey, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will be back here again next Thursday. Um, as far as I know. As far as I know. Yeah. I don't 14. think I. Yeah. Um, I actually don't have plans to leave the state until September. 
<laughs> <laughs> I have nothing but virtual plant clinic on my schedule for the next four Thursdays in a row. That's like the only thing. So I'll be here. I say I don't have plans. You know, I have a humongous family. So, you know, anything yeah. can happen at any time. But <laughs> yeah, you never know what's going to pop up. But hopefully, both of us will be back on here again next Thursday yeah. at 10 a.m. And like I said, if you want more information or if you live in an area where these fruit flies and snails actually are going to impact your life, follow us on Facebook because as we have classes come up, we'll share them here in a virtual plant clinic, but we share everything on Facebook and that's probably the best way to keep on top of everything that's happening and uh, the, the current information and everything else. And I always like the nice comments guys we oh, really brenda, appreciate that brenda yes you were right <laughs> about uh iding a flower it's a meadow beauty <laughs> i called it something else <laughs> <laughs> a flower <laughs> okay well thanks again guys we really really appreciate you all turning in and for everybody who watches this as a recording afterwards thank you for following us on Facebook and following mm -hmm. us online and watching this also. If you watch us after the fact and you're not able to join us live, if you ever have any questions, shoot me an email during the week and we'll answer your question live. And then when you watch it that evening or whenever you do, you're going to see the answer there. So more than happy to do our best to answer questions. Mm -hmm. So with that, thanks everybody. Have Thank a great you. week. Great. We'll see you next week.